Hi, this is Dick Ingersoll, the Perpetual Sightseer, and today I'm visiting the Alamance Battleground in Burlington, North Carolina. A lot of people say that this was the first battlefield of the American Revolution, but I'm going to let you make up your mind about that. I'm going to go through what led up to this battle, what happened at the battle, and what happened after the battle, and hopefully I'll give you enough information that you can let me know what you think. Was it the first battle of the American Revolution? We'll find out. In the mid-1700s, the coastal and Piedmont regions of North Carolina were distinctly different and separate. The coastal region was populated primarily by colonists of English birth or descent, and there was a strong allegiance to England. The seat of the government for the colony was also headquartered in the coastal region. The Piedmont was populated by self-sufficient settler farmers of German and Scotch-Irish heritage who, except for a few necessary trade goods like salt and pins, were able to live separately from the outside world. They were two fundamentally different groups of individuals, but both lived under the control of one government. And because there was so little trade or communication between these two groups, the gulf between them widened rather than narrowed. Because the lifestyle of the Piedmont settler was primarily farming for their own family and barter of their crops and services with their neighbors, they didn't produce a monetary income so it had little to no cash when it came time to pay their taxes. As a result, many of the farmers fell into significant debt. Debt wasn't uncommon at the time, but from 1755 to 1765, the cases brought to the Orange County, North Carolina docket increased nearly 16-fold, from 7 annually to 111. Many of these Piedmont settler farmers believed they were being overtaxed by the county and colonial officials in Hillsborough and that too much was expected of their modest yeoman farms. Many disagreed with being taxed to fund the construction of the new governor's residence in Newburn. The mansion called Tryon Palace, after colonial governor William Tryon, was of particular offense to the humble, hard-working citizens of Orange County. Like their Virginia and Massachusetts counterparts, the farmers of Orange County resisted taxation without representation. Some of the unhappy farmers, including Western Orange County farmer Herman Husband, wrote their complaints in articles known as the Regulator Advertisements. Their grievances included unfair land sales, illegal fees over taxation, and the seizures of property to pay taxes. The farmers, who became known as the Regulators, focused their anger on Edmund Fanning, highly educated outsider who had the responsibility of collecting taxes. Regulators accused Fanning of stealing land and pocketing the money made from the sale of the seized property. They saw Fanning's construction of a fine house on King Street in Hillsborough as proof of his corruption. Fanning, along with the other corrupt officials in Hillsborough, were known as the Courthouse Ring. With their complaints unanswered, the regulators took action in 1768. Seventy angry farmers rode into Hillsborough to recover a horse, bridle, and saddle seized by Edmund Fanning. In addition to seeking the seized property, the group vented their anger toward the courthouse ring by firing their guns into Fanning's house. Fanning alerted Governor Tryon, and regulator leaders Herman Husband and William Butler were arrested. Tryon in Newburn upset the regulators even more when he refused to hear their petitions. When Husband and Butler came up for trial, Tryon sent an armed force to intimidate the regulators and their supporters who had gathered in Hillsborough. Husband was acquitted, but Butler and two others convicted of the charge of inciting rebellion. Tryon pardoned the men, but he and the Colonial General Assembly continued to ignore the regulators' complaints. On September 24th of 1770, the anger of the farmers exploded in Hillsborough. A large crowd of regulators took over the courtroom and beat the officials and lawyers as the judge fled the building. Fanning was dragged into the street and beaten, and then the crowd turned to his home, destroyed its content, and cut the house from its location. Minor clashes continued for the next several years in almost every western county, but the only true battle of the war was the Battle of Alamance on May 16, 1771. Hostility between the regulators and the government came to a head in 1771. 
In May, Governor Tryon marched more than a thousand local militiamen to Hillsboro and then on to Alamance Creek in the western part of the county where 2,000 regulators were meeting. On the evening of May 15th, Tryon received word that the regulators were camped about six miles away. The next morning at about 8 a.m., Tryon's troops set out a field about one half mile from the camp of the regulators. He formed two lines and divided his artillery between the wings and the center of the first line. The regulators remained disorganized with no leadership, no officer ranked higher than captain, and no anticipation of an attack, expecting that their superior numbers would frighten Tryon's militia. Tryon sent one of his aides to camp, a Captain Fillmore Hawkins, and the sheriff of Orange County with a proclamation stating, To those who style themselves regulators, in reply to your petition of yesterday, I am to acquaint you that I have ever been attentive to the interests of your county and to every individual residing therein. I lament the fatal necessity to which you have now reduced me by withdrawing yourselves from the mercy of the crown and from the laws of your country. To require you who are now assembled as regulators to quietly lay down your arms, to surrender up your leaders to the laws of your country and rest on the leniency of the government. By accepting these terms within one hour from the delivery of this dispatch, you will prevent an effusion of blood. As you are at this time in a state of rebellion against your king, your country, and your laws. Signed, William Tryon. While the terms were being read, Tryon's troops began to move sh forward. Shortly after that, Tryon was informed that the regulators had rejected his terms. Herman Husband, a Quaker, Realizing violence was about to take place, left the area. By midday, the hour had expired, and Tryon sent one final warning. Gentlemen and regulators, to those of you who were not too far committed, should desist and quietly return to your homes. Those of you who have laid yourselves liable should submit without resistance. I and others promise to obtain for you the best possible terms. The governor will grant you nothing. You are unprepared for war. You have no cannon. You have no military training. You have no commanding officers to lead you in ballot, battle. You have no ammunition. You will be defeated. Some of the regulators petitioned the royal governor to give up seven captured regulators in exchange for two of his men that they had captured the previous day. Tryon agreed, but after half an hour, the captured officers didn't appear. He became suspicious that his positions were being flanked and ordered the militia to march within 30 yards of the regulators. Shortly thereafter, a large crowd of regulators appeared in front of the militia, waving their hats and daring the militia to open fire. At about this time, two men who had been attempting to negotiate a peace between the two sides left Tryon's camp, Reverend Caldwell and Robert Thompson. Caldwell made it to the field between the two lines, but was warned by the regulators who saw that the governor was about to open fire. Thompson was re detained by Tryon as a prisoner, and Tryon, in a moment of anger, took a musket from a militiaman and shot Thompson dead. Realizing what he had done, he sent a flag bearer named Dandled Malcolm with a white flag in hopes of calming things quickly. The flag bearer was himself fired upon by the regulators who called out, Fire and be damned. The regulators lacked the leadership, organization, and ammunition that Tryon had. But the early course of the battle went well for them. They employed what was referred to at the time as Indian-style fighting, hiding behind trees and avoiding structures and lines. This allowed two of the regulators' brothers, named McPherson, to capture one of Tryon's three cannons. Unfortunately for them, the regulators had no ammunition and it couldn't be used. A man considered one of the principal military leaders of the regulators, a Captain Montgomery, was killed by a shell at about the same time a bullet hit Tryon's hat. The governor sent a second white flag, but the aide-de-camp was killed while regulator Patrick Mueller called for his fellow insurgents to cease fire. Outraged at the disregard of a second white flag, the governor rallied his troops against the insurgents, whose ammunition was running out. Many of the regulators fled the field. Delays had prevented the 300 reinforcements under Captain Benjamin Merrill from arriving to help the regulators in time. Some of the regulators remained behind to continue firing upon the militia, and Tryon then ordered the woods to be set on fire. Losses for both sides are disputed. Tryon reported nine dead and 61 wounded among the militia. 
Other historians indicate a much greater number, between 15 and 27 killed. Both sides counted nine dead among the regulators and from dozens to over 100 wounded. Tryon took 13 prisoners. One of them, James Few, was executed at the camp and six were executed later nearby Hillsborough. Many regulators traveled on to frontier areas beyond North Carolina. The royal governor pardoned others and allowed them to stay on the condition that they pledge an oath of allegiance to the royal government. Within a month, Tryon had pardoned 6,400 regulators <clears throat> who surrendered their weapons and took an oath of loyalty to the crown. Tryon brought 12 of the 15 men taken prisoner to trial. Six of the men were convicted and sentenced to death while the other six were acquitted of the charges. On June 19th in 1771, the six convicted men, Benjamin Merrill, James Pugh, Captain Robert Mater, and two men whose names are unknown and one known only as Messer, were hanged east of the Orange County Courthouse. The hangings drew a large crowd, and for many they served as an example of the power of the colonial authorities. Soon after the battle, Tryon departed for a new job as governor of New York, and his troops left Orange County. Many of the main leaders remained in hiding until 1772, when they were no longer considered outlaws, and while others moved further west into places such as Tennessee, notably establishing both the Watauga Association at Sycamore Shoals in 1772, in present-day Elizabethton, Tennessee, and the state of Franklin in 1784, which was another short-lived republic that failed to join the Union of the United States. The coming of the American Revolution soon erased the differences between the two groups of Carolinians, and many men from both sides joined together in the fight for independence from Britain and served together in a common cause. In Hillsborough, North Carolina, at the site of the hanging, where the six regulators were hanged after the Battle of Alamance. One of the regulators, James Pugh, it was turned out, it turned out in uh, 2013, was probably actually his brother Enoch, because it was found later that James died much later and that Enoch died the same year of the hanging. So what do you think? Do you think maybe this was the first battle of the revolution? I think there's an argument that could be made. It certainly was the first battle against an oppressive British government for taxation without representation. So from that point of view, I would say yes, it was the first battle of the revolution. But from the standpoint of the citizens, they really were fighting for their rights as British citizens. They weren't fighting to become independent nation at that time. Didn't take long for that to happen, of course. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, I'd like you to share it with your friends that you think might enjoy it. I'd like you to give me a like and ultimately either subscribe to my channel or follow me on Facebook and I will keep you notified of any further videos that I do. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. We'll see you next time.